Well, thank you, sir. Good. Thank you. Actually, it's good afternoon. It's 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 noon in L.A. I can say that to you, Greg. So, um, yes. You know, we started yesterday talking with Massimo and Brady about how Technicolor has had such a wonderful um, experience in moving their entire infrastructure into the cloud and working remote processing. But what we didn't talk about was the actual the acquisition part of all of that. And and Greg, why don't you introduce yourself? Tell us who you are and what you do, and and then we'll kind of lead it into how we started, how you started this project, and how you started working with Technicolor and the Teradek tools to to facilitate your production. Um, it, it's kind of a nice story, and I don't think people understand the complexity of all the nature that we go into to get to that stuff on set. So, an introduction and just to what we're going to talk about today. Sure, sure. Yeah. Thanks a lot, Gary. Uh, so I'm Greg Chachio. I am the chair of the ASC Motion Imaging Technology Council's Workflow Committee. Uh, and Workflow uh, has several subcommittees under it, one in Advanced Data Management, one in ACES, and a new one in Cloud Architecture. Uh, I actually started out uh, in production many, many years ago and then went into post. And I actually worked at Technicolor for years, launching uh, digital, you know, uh, DP Lights and some other others. So I'm, I'm familiar with the post side first. And then I kind of got reacquainted with the production side, which is kind of where I came from. So it was a kind of come in full circle for me. That's pretty amazing. I mean, if people don't think about how a lot of us, you know, start as still photographers, move into post because of technology and they move back to camera because that was my lifestyle. And, you know, I and my association with the ASC and everything. I mean, I do the camera comparison chart that's so popular at the ASC, but I also yep. assisted, you know, in the 10th anniversary digital edition. I compiled the whole you know, catalog of digital cameras. So, you know, we have Sweet. a similar background. Yeah, and, and people yeah. think about all of that, about how much technology is so influential in what we do and how much we use it as artists. I, I mean, that's right. a big deal in all of this. Well, and we live in LA, right? So, so we started doing a lot of this, the remote stuff really for me started back in 2003. So going back, you know, about 18 years ago now, and it started with remote color. Now we live in Los Angeles, right? Uh, a big metropolis where, where deciding your post house often has to do with where your studio or production office was. Well, you get to the point where you just have certain people you really love working with and they may move around, right? So our, the first project I ever worked on was Technicolor Hollywood and Manhattan Beach Studios, not a 10 minute drive if you know LA. <laughs> so, so that's really where it started, but it was, it was point to point using T-Vips, right? And yeah. it, it was a lot of disparate uh, systems. You had a speakerphone here. You had a line here. The, the, the main thing was quality, right? You had to have uh, the highest quality, 10-bit and all that. So we got beyond that. Uh, we're going into editorial and all that and, and where, where performance is key, latency is key. Uh, the quality doesn't have to be 100%, but people are expecting more now. And we have better algorithms, better compression, uh, better yeah. tools. Well, and think about it. in 2003, we're still in the stone age for digital cameras. I mean, they yeah. barely had started to function. I mean, you know, the, the Phantom Menace and, and the Star Wars things had just been done and they had the, the very first yep. generation of digital cameras. F then. I mean, yeah, I was early on the DP light stuff and it's, and, you know, and people don't realize that, that the digital revolution and what we have now come to known as the cloud and digital processing and everything else really started about 2010, 2009, 2010, yep. you know, the Alexa came out in 2010 and kind of changed the way everybody thought of digital production until that time we were still recording on tape. We were still archiving, you know, massive amounts of tapes. We were still, you know, listening to Sony tell us that you know, 940 by 940 by 540, 960 by 540 was actually, you know, 1920, 1080. And, and Panasonic right, was doing didn't. the same thing. Panasonic was doing the same thing with, you know, strange tape formats that expanded like a, like uh, anamorphic. But, but this digital thing, we took over and, and, and became a new lifestyle. And, and I don't think people realize how much guys like you were working on and Teradek too was working on offset monitoring with a serve pro and being able to use you know when ios devices we never thought we'd actually be able to have a portable device that we could hold in our hand that would be color accurate to a certain degree and and yes. those kind of things are part of what that and and i mean you know i i kind of liken the cell phone as the fundamental change in our society that forced all of us to grow in a way we never thought we would before because it became yep. this instant connectivity 
And, and now we're talking about monitoring on these devices and using them as, as color reference materials. And, and this started before COVID. I mean, a lot of people don't realize that you were doing offset monitoring with Teradek tools and that two, three, four years ago. I mean, you know, we're thinking about wireless technology. I started working with Teradek remote onset 2009, 2010, 2011. So, so wow. that's how new this technology is for most people. And, right. and you know, and I, I want to hear about how you took what you were doing with Teradek and took it to the next level, because that's really important, because I don't think people understand how complex some of the productions you have to work on and work with are when it comes to this level of transmission, but also the security aspects and, and real time aspects and color and all of that. So we're going to move into that. Yeah, I just kind of lead anybody around just so they get an idea of what we're going to talk about. Sure, sure, sure. So so a lot of the stuff we've been doing over the years is kind of what I call nice to haves, right? Uh, sometimes yeah. it was an executive on the East Coast or somebody in London that had to see something. We've actually in the past sent complete systems out from one country to another, one city to another oh, yeah. to accommodate people. Well, that's very expensive. So now we're getting to the point where, you know, COVID hits, right? And all of a sudden now it's a necessity. Now everyone says, okay, you know, I've kind of been dabbling in this when, when, when I needed to, but it really wasn't, when a push came to shove and, and, and day one comes up, we just kind of all gravitate to what we've been doing because that's what we do. There's a, we have a, enough on our plate already, right? So, so now, now all of a sudden, you know, this project comes up, the, the main, the main uh, thrusts for ripple effect were really three main things and they're all interrelated. Virtual production, so working against LED walls, uh, remote production, and then of course, all really umbrellaed over COVID, right? So COVID is the wow. reason why we're doing all this. So, so, in, in we, and we were talking about remote camera systems and, you know, jibs and all that. Of course, ACs have been working remotely for a long time, right? When's the last time a focus puller was actually right on the lens, right? Yeah, so exactly. we, so a lot of these tools existed. So now it's a matter of, okay, let's, let's find out you know, in, a, in our, I have a, I have a Miro diagram, which I can show, which kind of started out as my workflow palette and then ended up being the, the COVID thing. I literally had a line and it was above the line and below the line, but in this case, it was who's onset, who's offset and who's off lot completely. And, and yeah. by, by adding some of these modules in there, we can move people until we were in compliance. So, you know, we had two main stages. We had XR stage in Pacoima. Uh, we had uh, Lux Machina in, in their stage downtown LA in the Arts District, right. and, and they had their very different size volumes. And a product, a, pro a project like the ETC, um, you know, we're not, a, we're not a paying project, right? We're a research arm of, of the <laughs> USC School of Cinema. And so, so this is, is the project that studios will kind of fund and, and, and work with us on to prove these concepts. So right. we had kind of special constraints. Teradek was amazing and that they provided all this gear. Now keep in mind, the Teradek gear is already on the cameras. Every project I know has a Teradek cube or something on the camera. So it's really got, it yeah, starts right there. Right, and, 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 and you know, we're, we're all that way because we all know the tools in that. There's always something around. I mean, as a DIT and, and, and on set colorist, I'm the guy with, that's, you know, delivering the serve pro stuff, but the bolts are coming into me so I can do monitoring or I'm running iris or something else where the AC is pulling focus. I, I mean, you know, because that's how it works in those kind of productions for people who don't work in larger production aspects. But yes. But, Talk about some of the complexity of this. So you're talking, we've got a set, we've got, you know, the DP and the AC and the director are, are on set, but, but how did you start connecting people near set and off lot? And, and exactly. that's an important part about all of this. Okay. Let me share my screen real quick. Sure. And I'll go through this first. Let's pull up the, the mirror board. Pretty good. Okay. Yeah. So, so for those of you who are not uh, familiar, Miro is a great tool. We use this uh, kind of with all of our teams. We have our whole virtual production kind of uh, single line schematics. Uh, I've got on set, I've got details of the cart and on the cloud infrastructure side, but we're going to, for the purposes of this discussion, kind of zero in on the on set portion here. Um, so you can see here, like I was talking about, we have on stage, we have off stage and off lot, and, and, and we had certain requirements, right? So uh, in the LA side, we started out, let's say shoot day one on a Monday, with everyone being on stage, not everyone, but most people, all the executives, any of the producers 
that you normally would have uh, on a commercial agency people would normally be floating around on set. Well, that couldn't happen. So anyone that's not going to be directly interacting with step basically had to be off. Now, um, what happened was a couple things actually, um, that, that again, if you're prepared, and I always say this, have an A plan, a B plan, and a C plan. And because and, yes. you're going to need them. So, so one of the things that happened is, and again, these volumes are not uh, uh, prevalent. There's not too many of these volumes out there. Um, to give you an idea of the size we're talking about, you know, something under the Mandalorian size, but something way bigger than uh, your average small volume, uh, or even something at the Lux Machina test stage downtown. Um, yeah. So, so basically, um, to get the volume that we needed, we went to XR stage. They had this great volume that was made up of largely, honestly, touring LED backdrops. Because remember, these backdrops were really, these, these LED walls were designed for live production. So concerts, uh, sporting events, things like that. So they were not used to having people shoot there. And at the time, we had 35 megabits of bandwidth. Wow. Now it's it's since been upgraded, but at the time you can imagine how that would kind of hamper some of the things we wanted to do with getting data on and offset. Well, that's your but able. That's, case, that, that's that's an, an yeah. average cable connection. That's not even a big. That's not even a heavy duty cable connection. So yeah, I mean it's a little different on the business side. I have four hundred down at home and twenty up. Uh, you know, we had basically thirty five symmetrical up and down, um, which by the way is fine for Teradek, but we had pl grander plans of sending all the data out. So basically we're on stage there and all of a sudden a couple of things happen. Number one is the director, we, okay, we pushed four days due to things that happened in production, right? We had uh, some, some rewrites and this and that. So now our production starting four days later. Well, the director comes to me and says, um, I'm gonna be in Florida on the day I'm supposed to direct. So it's two directors, two locations, four shoot days. So, so, so Margo, our director, is all of a sudden now needing to direct from Florida. How do we do that? Okay, so so just to also to back up, we had Fifth Kind as one of our partners. And Fifth Kind, for those of you who don't know, is an asset management system and everything that the production does from script to uh, animatics, to smooth boards, to any kind of asset at all, all of our dailies, it's all in Fifth Kind. And it's very secure. And the nice thing about Fifth Kind is if you're working on the production, and you already have credentials, there's a big, big button on the top on shoot days, it says live. It's super simple. All you have to do is log in as you always logged in and hit the live button. Um, so that's great. The thing is, there's a certain amount of latency going through a large streaming platform like that. So in this specific example, uh, you know, John uh, Landman at Teradek uh, and I were working together on this and I said, I've got to get images down to Margo in, you know, as, as a low latency as possible, let's say, you know, sub two or three seconds. So what we did is we gave Margo a, a special login to the Teradek core. And so now, uh, you know, she could basically direct from the East Coast and she did it. Uh, there's the second director, Hannah, who was on set, basically was relaying all the instructions back and forth. Um, if I had a little more time and we had one director, I could easily set up kind of a God PA system on, on stage and we could do it that way. Um, and that worked really well. The so, so other thing, before we, go any, yeah. Yeah, before, before we go any farther, give people some kind of idea of the delay between going through a normal streaming service and connecting to to the the native core account, which is Teradex handling of all of the yeah. processing on, in, in the cloud. What was the sure. time difference? Was it was it a couple of seconds or was it was it actually minutes of difference? Right. So so um, if any of you have done like like right now, I'm sure we're broadcasting right or on Zoom, but sometimes there's a restream. Those restreams can take 30 to 40 seconds. That's very standard in any sort of large streaming platform. You're talking about 30, 35 seconds. That's just the nature of the beast. Uh, you're 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 it's a different type of, um, of of scale, different type of infrastructure. In this case, we're kind of going one to one. Right. So we've got uh, uh, our our setup here on stage and we have really only a couple users. I'm using it from a QA perspective so I can make sure that everything looks right. I've got my admin screen so I can grant access to users uh, and just making sure everything's working correctly. Uh, and then everyone else can see it on fifth kind. Now, if they're not on stage, 30 seconds is pretty much live to them, right? Yeah. They're just basically viewing it. Um, and, and there's other advantages too. They've got all kinds of metadata they can re review. 
Um, if they want to review the dailies later, it's all there uh, in, in the fifth kind dailies. Uh, so you kind of have instant dailies as well. So well, and that's an, here's that's another an thing. Part of yeah. the, uh, go ahead. Go ahead. No, you go first. No, no. No, go ahead with that, and then I'll, I'll take it. I, I was gonna, uh, I was gonna say, and and that brings up an important point because you're working in a virtual production, and and one of the things that that guys like me have harped on for for a couple of decades now is metadata. You got to capture all the metadata, and now when you're working in vir in the virtual production, you're generating data before the production even starts because of how the environment has to be built in the world, you know, the world building for for Unreal Engine. But it's yeah. also about all of the camera metadata. It's lens metadata. It's the camera positioning stuff. It's uh, the crane information. It's height and weight data. It's the tracking information from the system. I mean, there's a lot of additional data in that kind of environment that needs to be captured and needs to be held. Um, in a proper container in a proper way so that it can be used all the way down through post. And this is a whole new level of data management that I don't think a lot of people have considered when they start thinking about, you know, the complexity of virtual production and the added needs of data to be able to maintain it all the way through the production. That's right. Absolutely, Gary. So, you know, on that end, and I know we're mainly talking about remote production, but you're absolutely right. And at the ASC, um, we've got uh, underneath, I was saying workflow, we have advanced data management. We're working on a couple of key initiatives, one of which was used uh, here, which is the ASC MHL or media hash list that is now integrated into SilverStack. So the nice mm -hmm. thing about that is you have a, a hash list basically in a, in a manifest that travels with the data that says that everything that I send you is, is, is indeed there and you can uh, confirm against it. So that's, yeah, the, and we also have a framing. Yeah. We're just now working on a framing decision list that basically simplifies and transports framing information uh, to, to multiple systems so you're not guessing about framing. But that's, again, just, you're right, there's a lot of metadata. We have Perforce here on the Unreal side uh, for uh, uh, you know change management, asset management. We have mm -hmm. F-Track for the asset management, Fifth Kind, and Bluescape for a lot of our boards uh, for, yeah. uh, for storyboards, et cetera. So a lot of these things um, are kind of disparate. And I have to say, we had integration meetings uh, every every week where basically we can see you know what what solutions can be integrated and have hooks into one another, which worked really well. So here's another thing that happened, by the way, uh, as as I'm sure you've heard a bunch of stories that have happened lately is our our DP uh, days before we went into production uh, tested positive for COVID. Yeah, so now now all of a sudden um, we have a new DP, and as often happens in the wake of something like that, much a lot of the crew in that area all kind of went with them. So we mm -hmm. now have uh, no no playback operator. Uh, ACs had to be replaced, um, and so with that, you know, of course, a little a little um, added added stress to, to bring these uh, these guys up to speed, yeah. uh, guys and gals. And uh, the nice thing again about not, not having a playback, you know, we had a QTake operator and we had all that going. Um, we were able to review everything later on. And it kind of makes that, that you know, you want to have ideally someone that could instantly play something back. Uh, but we had the, the fifth kind uh, system where we can play back in. And you can do that in Teradek as well. We didn't utilize their cloud recording capability on that project, but on the very next one we did. And that worked fine. So that was an interesting just... challenge. See, and that's and, and that's and that's the interesting part about it because you're you're basically working with a lot of off-the-shelf technology to advance a, a, a cutting-edge developmental project that's literally you know the kind of thing that people are going to be looking at two or three years from now as a normal case. You're doing it as development process in, in a way that a lot of people haven't seen. And and you know, it's data management, but it's also got at the last minute to change half your crew right out of the bat. That's got to be tough. And, and have to deal with that from a producer, technical director standpoint, like you are as the head of production here, it's gotta be complicated. And, and you know, and it, it, it goes to show people even in times like these, how important it is communication between the crew and, and management and how you have to stay in sync with each other. Uh, and the more complex the project, the more people need to talk to each other and need to maintain all of that data flow. So. That's right. Absolutely. And, and, and also, by the way, to keep the, 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 the crew kind of minimized on stage, uh, we had uh, monitors. And the nice thing about this, a lot like, for instance, let's say XR and actually Lux Machina, both locations happen to have the ubiquitous, you know, large screen TV. So 
Um, we did have a very high quality. LG brought a, uh, a, mm. a, a beautiful C9 series. Uh, actually, it wasn't LG. Uh, it was an LG monitor, but it was actually Colorfront, who, by the way, supplied a lot of the gear. We were, in, we were an all HDR 4K project. We were shooting wow. uh, uh, Alexa LF. Uh, so we wanted to make sure, I wanted to make sure, uh, you know, besides all the remote stuff I was doing, of course, um, you know, I would be looked at uh, with, with, with severe scrutiny if I didn't make sure that we, we use the, the highest quality of having an ACES uh, uh, subcommittee under our, our, our committee. Uh, I wanted to make sure that we used ACES. We used uh, ACES 1.2. So again, not to segue too much, but um, we basically had our onset monitoring in UHD. We were in P3 color space. Our reference was 1,000 nits HDR using the Sony uh, uh, X300 professional display. Mm -hmm. Uh, we were in PQ, and that was our creative aspect ratio 185. Uh, and then we haven't actually done theatrical mastering because there's no theaters to go to. But the nice thing is we have all of our, our ACES files uh, archived so that we can do that. And the editorial worked in good old HD 709. Uh, so uh, the and, and great thing is, yeah. I was just going to say, just for everybody out there, if, if they don't realize what ACES is, it's the Academy Color Encoding System um, that de was developed by uh, the American Society of Cinematographers and the Academy of Motion Picture Sciences to be able to, to kind of give people an idea of what color is supposed to be. So when he's talking about ACES, he's talking about the color workflow that was developed in association with the ASC by the Academy to develop a color yeah. workflow. So. Yeah, the Academy have, have the, the brain trust there. The ASC worked along with the Academy. There are a lot of members that are common, but basically yeah. what we wanted to do is, is, is we, we always have been working in what we call display referred space, which is basically you point a camera, you look at a monitor and that's the goal, right? I'm going to broadcast or I'm going to do a theatrical. In this case, like you said, we've improved our, our, our imaging chain so that our digital cameras have such great dynamic range. We never really see it. And if you want to go from a broadcast to a theatrical, it used to mean starting over because you've right. stepped on too many things to get that to look correctly. So what we're doing is we're starting out with a very, very wide space. Well, I can't, I don't have enough room here on my camera, but very <laughs> wide space. Um, and the idea is that you make all your decisions in that large space. And at the very end is where you put your output transform. So at the very end is where you take it down to, you know, TV, to theatrical, to whatever you need to do. And it's right. great because it just means one decision to rule them all and you don't have to go back and remaster. So anyway, um, the, the great thing about this, the, the, the Teradex system as well, is in these locations where I needed to get people offset, they didn't have to be basically directly here. Again, we have the DP, we have myself, we have some a few people looking at the X300, and then we had a, a larger LG display, which I've got pictures, um, which was basically where all the keys were in the director. And then if there's any key or anybody that didn't have to be directly on stage, all I had to do is simply bring in an Apple TV. You know, most of these places already had displays in their lobbies and their waiting rooms. And all I had to do is slap that Apple TV with an HDMI cable in there and we're up and going. And now we have right. remote video villages all over the stage or off stage, all over the set. Well, the, and, the and, and so, you're using yeah. and you're using an off the shelf technology with the Apple TVs to actually give you to render out a high quality image because gee, they're HDR compatible and they, they allow for Dolby science to be processed through them. And, and that's an Absolutely. advantage that a lot, a lot of people don't think about, you know, and that that working with Apple, the Apple TV devices takes a lot of the strain out as much as iPads do. I mean, think about what we used to do before we had an, a, a color reference handheld device you know that that changed all of us and you know and, yes. and all of us have kind of been kind of surprised at just how ipads have done that we talked about that yesterday with massimo and Bra brady about how just having uh, you know a device that allows you to see a high enough quality image that can be used as a reference is kind of a rarity in our industry <laughs> you know it's funny it, it so often we've seen consumer products take over the professionals. It happened years ago when Sony discontinued their, their CRT monitors, right? They had the, the beautiful A32s and A24s and the tubes stopped becoming available. And guess what? We started using originally Pioneer plasmas and then Panasonic plasmas. And it kind of forced us to rethink the quality level and what we're looking at. Now, you know, we'd all love professional gear, but when it's not available, you do what you have to do. These new OLEDs, 
you know, I tell you, they're beautiful. I, I have a, you know, a Sony Z9D at home. The LG OLEDs are gorgeous. Samsung makes yeah. beautiful sets as well. And you can make them look exactly like the professionals. And the great thing about the iPads, and we started using iPads years ago when we realized there's no color controls on. No. Nope. Right? It's so, locked. so, you know, you, 709. there's some yeah. really, it's, it's <laughs> locked. And there's an MP3 now. So where yeah. there's some excellent color scientists up at Apple and the nice thing about it, other than controlling your ambient lighting with the little brightness slider, you know, you can take that iPad and what, what most facilities will do is they'll put that iPad up against the mastering monitor, make sure they look good, and then off they go. And there's nothing yeah. you can do to screw it up other than- maybe Yeah, you can't adjust the sharpness or anything else. There's a question no. from the audience about, about the LG C9 as a, as a secondary reference monitor. You choose that, that's Video Village, right? You just use it in place of where yes. you'd normally have a larger set from before. It's not any different. You're just using a consumer set rather than using a larger reference display. So yes, and I'm gonna uh, let's see if I can pop up, pop this up. So this is our this is XR stage. Uh, there's Dane, our DIT extraordinaire. This is a yep. what the uh, live feed looks like. Uh, you can see off to the right here. Uh, I'll probably have a closer. Uh, you can see the LG. And then to the right of it, the smaller one is the Sony X300. Um, I'm going to bounce around a little bit here. Okay. Uh, doo -doo -doo -doo. Here's our visual effects uh, supervisor. She is working also off uh, Teradek and she's reviewing uh, through the camera. Um, you know, you can look at, actually, you can see these controls up here. Uh, you can look at uh, a single, single feed, dual feed, quad. Uh, on another project, we actually fed scopes. Uh, so we have a secondary project besides Ripple yeah. Effect where we're actually evaluating LED walls and and, and looking at the performance characteristics that, that are emitted, uh, profiling displays, uh, looking at the engines that drive them, the processing units. And we have people from, you know, we have Weta and New Zealand and others that are involved in looking at these. So it became important to feed the scope output into that right. so they can look, they can see what they're seeing on the monitor, but verify it numerically on the scopes. Yeah, and that's a, and that's a so, built-in function of the of the serve software. So, and and even the core yeah, exactly. software has that built fundamentally fundamentally built into it. So, yeah, you know, and I don't think people realize how much that you know, guys like you build these kinds of things around the tools that somebody might not even know is in an application. I mean, I've used the serve pro stuff for a few years have, with through my association with Teradek, but I also used it because it really really works well and the controls you talk about are one of the things that that made it easier to handle it in a live environment totally totally this is the the same stage by the way with the walls reconfigured uh they're very configurable so this is actually another type of event um but you can see uh here this is actually uh, a teradex newer product than we had it actually was not available um, when we were doing, that's how quickly these things change. In August, we didn't have the ability to have this, uh, but this is their, their prism, basically the rack mounted system. So these cars basically function uh, like the individual cigarette pack units. Um, and, and we were using this on stage uh, to do reviews here. And you can see we've got, um, let's see the A camera. We had, a, we had a, a Alexa LF here and a Sony Venice in this case. Uh, we had standing by a red uh, as well. And then we, you can see here, we're actually running a Zoom session. So what we had is we had executives, basically uh, dozens and dozens of executives that all had the uh, Teradek uh, core feed as well as the Zoom. So the Zoom was being used basically to do the communication back and forth. We right. had the output of my system here into a focus drive preamp into, uh, into a PA system on stage. So uh, anyone dialing in could ask questions and everyone can hear the question and then we would answer it. But but we were not relying on Zoom video, of course, that would make sense. We're, we, so basically we had the, you know, the, the Teradek feed um, and the latency was even, even less than we had on Ripple Effect. Wow. That's kind of amazing when you think about it, that, that, yeah. that, that, you know, that you're actually having a worldwide conversation or a nationwide conversation in real time. Uh, you know, just being able to do what we thought could never be done that way. Yes. And it's changed. Yeah, course, absolutely. Course, now here we are setting with them controlling a rover on Mars in real time, and we're getting feedback right. in, in, in you know, seconds instead of hours or days. So it's, it's yeah. amazing what we can do there now. Um, and by know, the way, a couple of tools real quickly. Um, there are tools built into Teradex viewer app. Uh, so mm -hmm. the viewer app is a simplified app. That's what you're seeing here. 
This gives you the little camera A, B, C, D switcher, the ability to go between a single, a, a dual, or quad. But you also have built-in uh, uh, scopes. So we've got uh, you know a vector scope and waveform here, as well as there are others uh, that you can pull up as well. So that's kind of nice. Um, uh, and, and a huge ad. I, these are value ads for me. I didn't even know they were there until I started yeah. playing around with it. Well, and I like the fact with the viewer app, you can actually bring in multiple cameras. I mean, the multiple camera view is one of those things that's really nice if you're working in an AB camera or a multi-cam setup to be able to have one, two, three, four cameras set up and be able to watch that. Um, you know, and, yep. and, and it's those kind of tools that make life easier. Um, I want to go back to the metadata for a minute because that's a, that, yeah. that's still one of those things we were talking about yesterday with Massimo and Brady on on it. And I, I don't think people realize how difficult it is to maintain the kind of metadata workflow that is necessary for a virtual production. I, I mean, I, it's it's far more data than people have ever used to. You know, you know, and DITs have whined about, well, you know, I, I gave you the camera, you know, sheet. It's it's like, what what else do you need? You got you you got the you got the sheet. You got that piece of paper. Doesn't that enough? And it's like, <laughs> no, 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 not for what we do now, because you know, we, we're literally start talking about you know extended data. You know, with Airy, it's LDS and how they do data. It's the external encoders to match the internal data. So there's analog and digital encoders all align and aligning to each other at the same time. In addition to, you know, in a virtual production, you have to build the entire environment before you even walk into the production. That's so right. There's a whole, there's a whole lot of work done ahead of time that used to be after the fact and is now long before you ever start production. And, and that kind of data needs to be able to go back and forth, especially when you're using cranes, when jibs and anything else with camera movement in it. You know, even the ability yeah. to track the system if you're using, you know, a steady cam is still far more complicated than people are accounting for. And, and it's the data that's workflow right. that's important. You know, the fact that color fronts involved and, and, and that, those are, those are all just sad. Um, did you have any issues with the multiple different kinds of cameras and how they functioned in this, since you were obviously testing multiple cameras simultaneously. So yeah, so on Ripple Effect, actually, we it was a single camera. So we went Alexa LF uh, for this. The, the further testing we're doing, we use the Sony Venice as well. Uh, Red has some great cameras as well. And so it's really complicated because if you think about it, whenever we went from one technology to another, there's usually one thing that changed, right? <laughs> we were changing from standard F to high def, man, we thought that was a big deal. Now, in retrospect, that was nothing. That was like oh, a resolution change, big deal. Um, then we you know, we moved from from uh, film to tape, tape to digital. I think I think red with the raw was something that you know hit a lot of people kind of uh, out of left field, and they didn't know what to do with raw. But but now when you look at it, holy crap, we've got we've got we've got virtual production happening, and by that I mean the LED backgrounds. Um, we also have. Mm -hmm. Um, a shift now kind of into where we, how we used to do things with rather than just throw a green screen up behind everything and just, oh, we'll just have to do it later. As we know, you know, if you, if, if you, if you really don't plan out your shots carefully and you think that you can always defer your problems to later, sometimes no matter how much you shoot, you don't have a story. So right. it kind of forces us to really think about that. And, and studios are even saying, well, wait a minute with these big LED walls, there's a lot, a lot more cost there. So what we're saying is you have you're moving your visual effects budget upstream, and right. and there's a lot more planning that has to happen. Um, you typically call the back end visual effects and the front end previs, but now you know as we all know when we were looking at uh, you know playback in the film days, you had a black and white 180 shutter flickering image. Now you have obviously images people judge by to the point where they don't always look at scopes or the light meter and they go, hey. Oh, you, oh, you, mean, you mean it's not a black and white tap on a film camera? <laughs> that's, that's right. Well, a that standard def you, black and white tap. <laughs> yes, that forced you to have discipline, right? And that forced you to review your dailies as you swung by the lab at six in the morning before you went to set uh, and made sure everything looked good. So, uh -huh. so now we've, we've got a lot of that process moving up. I'm actually taking the Unreal Fellowship right now. So I'm, I'm in my week two of, of five weeks learning Unreal wow. Engine, which is a lot of fun. Um, but but you realize there's a lot of stuff you have to do at the front end and 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 DPs and and you know VAD, which means some people, what's VAD, you know, you know, virtual art department. So you've got these teams of people that are working together in a way that we really weren't doing before. It, especially with COVID. And listen, COVID, it's COVID today. Tomorrow will be something else. There'll be so, you know, we'll, we're not gonna go back to where we were. We're not gonna be like we are now. It's gonna be something in the middle. I think we all understand that. But but I think when people see the advantages 
of having a stage LIDAR scanned probably once unless it gets reconfigured and having keys be able to go into Unreal Engine or another tool that uses universal scene descriptor or some standard, some open standard that allows you to start placing your lights and seeing the set pieces move in real time. Um, or even if it's not real time, you want to get to that at, at eight o'clock at night after your kids are, you know, after you've had dinner and you want to go in and you want to finish lighting that scene, you'll be doing that in an engine. You'll be doing that yeah. offline. And then when you get to set, whenever that is, because of the finances, they're going to be booking these stages pretty tightly. If everything's done right, you sh it should just be plug and play. And the walk. metadata is yeah. critical to that. Yes. And, 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 and that's the point about this is, is that people aren't thinking about that because they've ignored man, met, camera metadata forever. You know, it's been, it's been a side, <clears throat> excuse me, a sidebar, but it's been one of those things, especially as we moved into log formats and people started working with lookup tables and all that kind of stuff. And now we're with Unreal, we literally have to do things like map iris and focus and zoom position to be able to do that. We've got to be able to control right. all of the elemental functions of the camera in real time so that the previs matches the camera or vice versa. And it's those kind of things that, that have changed the whole aspect from what it is because it's a, it's a different data load. And, and one of the problems I know that goes on with this, and I wanted to see how you handled it, um, was that you know a lot of the formats don't record all the data you really need. You know, um, you know ProRes, for a good example, doesn't record LDS or I or slash cook I data. You know, it doesn't right. work with any of the systems as a, as a recording format. And, and did you run into any of those barriers or were because of how you were working, you didn't hit any of the, oh, gee, we need to, we're, we're dumbing this part down for a reason. And then, oh, it's going to bite us in the ass later. So, you know, in this production, we actually didn't. So we were shooting Airy Raw. So we didn't have any problems yeah. with limitations of, of the codec. Um, and we were pretty much um, camera locked on a dolly. Um, uh, you know, we had a, a steady cam shot, which <clears> we did a lot. Now we had use cases, right? So. Part of this is to make make a short, but the more important part of is really to to go through the use cases brought up by the studio. So you know what happens when you take a camera and um, the the a wall is at sixty and you're shooting at twenty four. What's the what's the shutter angle? How what are the movement like? Can you move uh, vertically? Can you move horizontally? Can you arc around? What happens when you do that? Uh, and we did have some artifacts. You know what about the shape yeah. of the volume? Is it have uh, oval corners? Is it rounded? Is it square? Like so, there, mm -hmm. there's a there's a hundred and one things to do uh, to make sure that that you minimize your artifacts. And you know these these screens are flexible and they're always changing. So you know right now, pretty much it's the row black pearl. That's the one that everybody's. That's that's the Mandalorian yeah. one. And that's the one everyone yeah. uses. But you've got yeah. Samsung and you've got LG and you've got others. Sony with the C LED. Um, everyone is kind of scrambling to repurpose things that great products they already have and really kind of, you know, use them for what they, what they're needed for right now, which is virtual production. And so, well, so the meta, and, and, and by the way, a, an important topic, the DIT, you know, there was no DIT before 2000, you know, two or three, right. It, well, it, it came out of a need. So you had people that were in, in playback or other areas that said, you know what, um, these digital cameras came out, the ACs weren't familiar with them. Somebody had to master the side, and the DIT was born. Um, we're now at another, yes, there you go. And, and another, <laughs> another thing has happened, which is happening now, which is um, people like Dane, um, who are master DITs and, and kind of widened outside of just their scope of that area are yeah. really honestly production technologists. And what they're yes. doing is, 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 if you just say, like you said, hey, I gave you what I gave you, that can't you just take this? Well. The, the, the post supervisors and the, and, the, and the people on stage, they're like, well, someone has to take ownership of this. Right. Who, who's, oh, yeah. who's making sure, because you have, like you said, you've got LDS, you know, you've got camera data, you've got lens data, you have lighting data, right? So we've got, we've got all of that in addition to scripty and all these things that have to get merged. Somebody on the production needs to be in charge of this. It can't be a vendor, it can't be a solution. It has to be someone on the production that can basically wrangle all this. And the, 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 some of the DITs like Dane are saying, well, what's next? I've done this. Of course, it's, it, there's, it's evolving, but I want a revolution. So I want basically to come on and say, you know, I'm going to be the person that, that, that will take ownership of this area. They already have data managers or, or, or you know, data loaders working for them. 
right? Yeah. So they're the ones that are authorized to work on color. They're part of Local 600. They work with the DP. They're the director of photography's you know, right hand when it comes to imaging. Um, the data copying is an extremely important job, but it's a, it's a technical position. So there's also going to be the person that's in charge of all the networking. So yeah. typically when you shoot something, you've got video village, but that's where everything stopped. Now with the ability to send images, not only off lot, but anywhere in the world, you also have people looking at, at not non-baked images. And right. this is important. As we are going to start sending log data out or log video out with instruction sets to say how this gets transformed, that needs to be managed properly. Otherwise, people will see things that are not intended by the cinematographer. And that's one of the things that we're concentrating on. And, and, and that brings up an interesting point that, that Massimo and Brady talked about yesterday was the fact that, you know, you can't send an uncorrected image to a client and say, it's not going to look like this later, but it's okay. So right. you, you have those kind of battles. And, and the other thing that comes in all of this is, is the crazy part about this, you know, being the same kind of person and knowing Dane personally, um, uh, <laughs> that, you know, it's the same kind of work I do. And, and we laugh at it, but it's, it's, you know, how much broadcast knowledge did you have to bring to your virtual productions? I mean, that's the part that people forget about. You, you know, you're talking about, well, I'm shooting 24, I'm actually shooting 23.9a, the, oh, the right. wall is at integer 60 because, oh, gee, computers don't do drop frame very well. And then you start getting into things like tri-level sync and black burst and how you handle, you know, um, I've got this display at 30, I've got that display at 60p, and we're shooting at 23.98, and they all have to hit the clock at same time and that's right. a whole nother level and, and the clock has to work both on the analog cameras systems the digital things and the the virtual world the same way and and we've talked about metadata but you know you brought up something that that a lot of people aren't thinking about in this process is you have to keep all that lighting data too because all that lighting yes. data has to be mirrored in the virtual world so all of the settings for all of the lights and all of that communication needs to be added too because if you change something in the virtual world it has to mirror in the real world and this is one of those parts of virtual production that a lot of people stumble on and and yep. it's and you know it sounds like you guys really went out of your way to make sure that every single aspect of the production moving forward was, was covered and it sets a great reference point for the rest of us so yeah it, it, it's again we've got different different uh solutions that were are being repurposed like the led walls for for live you know so that when you're in the hundredth row in the concert arena you can actually see the lead singer right that's what they were designed yeah. with they're not not highly dense right we're talking about you know, 2.84 millimeter pixels, uh, you know, uh, that, that, that's that's pretty to center coarse. Point. Yeah, <laughs> that's pretty coarse, right? For our bit, for what we do, but there, you know, already now you've got one sub one, you know, millimeter. So that's increasing. You've got the Unreal Engine that was designed for gaming, right? Primarily a Gamma 2.2. It's got that that kind of uh, low con look. Um, we're now getting into, you know, they're, the, the slash eye, like you were saying, Zeiss, you know, they use the, the, the modified, data, the, yeah. the slash eye, yeah. So, so we've got that information that there's there's efforts underway to get that into the Unreal Engine so that when you do your rack focus that the background racks with it. These are all things that, that can be keyframe manually, but why not have them done, done, done automatically? And so be much more friendly to filmmakers as well. You've got, there's an effort, I believe, I can't say too much about it, but um, where uh, gel data is being fed in. So rather right. than going yeah. through and doing RGB zero to two, five, five, you can say, okay, I want to use, uh, you know, surprise pink uh, number 51, Roscoe, you know, type that in and have that automatically, you know, go to the right value. Well, which, so, we, which we've already yeah. seen from, from, you know, Airy does that, Cineo does that, Light Panels has done that to be able to actually put true Roscoe filters in. We had a question in, right. in the pit that kind of reflects to this. Um, and, and Catherine Moore, who's, who's uh, a post-production supervisor in New York, who's, who I've interacted with the last couple of days, she was actually cooking last night when we were talking. She asked about what's a workflow supervisor and says it is similar to a DIT, or is it coming in during post and visual effects? And, and I, I mean, I have an explanation for this, but I want to think, what, how do you, what do you consider a workflow supervisor in their role on set and post? Yeah, so so um, right now, my understanding is that studios have these positions. They're usually staff positions, and they mm -hmm. kind of uh, uh, go through uh, the workflow uh, for all their productions. And then also on the post side, if you've chosen a post house, you have uh, people that are that are kind of workflow specialists. But what's happening now? There is there is a trend. You know, it used to be this is how it worked. 
I'm a studio. I have a, 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 a film I want to make or TV show. Um, I, I, I give it to a certain post house and they figure it out and they do everything that, you know, it, I, I worked uh, for, for technical or for deluxe or SIM where they have got lots of different services. Um, the way things are going with cloud and with um, the movie labs, 2030 vision and with decentralization, and it's going to be a democratizer for talent worldwide. Um, you're going to have, I, I believe you're going to have to have the production own all of that. There's going to yeah. be too much, too many details for a studio, you know, staff person to, 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 to do for, for everything. So, you know, whatever you call it, uh, you know, a production technologist, a workflow supervisor, all great names. Um, somebody that basically has to liaise with editorial, with visual effects, with previs, you know, companies, the third floors, the halons, et cetera, um, with the production and, and make sure that all of the data and metadata is all managed properly. And, 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 that's a, and that's now a position that starts way before production when we're talking virtual production, because yeah. that has to be, you, you have data wranglers for visual effects in post and, and, and production supervisors in post. Now what's happening is, is that those kind of people are moving into the other, other elemental parts of production. And, you know, people who understand how workflow functions and how to handle data at large volumes are not intimidated by how Unreal Engine generates files or anything else. And you start building this rapport with the crews and the talent and everything else that, that, that and I'm, by talent, I mean off-screen talent, the, the, the people that actually make the movies. Um, and it's important because now you're starting to see this, this level of, um, interaction across the sets that wasn't so common in the film era, but has really grown to be the, the new standard for modern production where everybody's got to communicate all the way through. So, yeah. Yeah. I mean, wouldn't, we're not nearly there yet, but wouldn't it be cool oh, no. if, 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 if an, an actress was wearing a, a, a certain a teal colored dress and the, the gaffer put a certain type of LED fixture uh, and we knew that we were going to have a certain type of camera. Wouldn't it be nice to know that when that light reflects off that, that, that the color doesn't look the way it's supposed to look? I mean, this is, these are things that happen in real life. And that is, the, that is the idea is that you can audition and you can play with these things uh, non-destructively and change them on the fly. So can you imagine just grabbing that color you know, dress and just turning it until the costume designer is happy with it, but it looks proper rather than the way, or changing out that LED fixture to a different type of fixture so that mm -hmm. it preserved that color. That, that's where well, we're headed. Well, see, and, and that's an interesting part because people don't think that that's going on. And, and you know, I like to talk about, because I've been somebody who spoke for the Academy on ACES and talk about color science and the color lighting. Yeah. I mean, the lighting project is a big deal. And, and people don't realize that the ASC first wrote about color in lights in 1918, 1920, in the very first ASC manual. There's, and it's a description, we're still shooting in black and white. And they talk about how sodium vapor is going to affect color imagery in a black and white film from a yeah. document that's available on the ASC website. So those are the kind right. of things that people don't think about, that, that some of this has been worked for, for you know, literally 100 years as we've dealt with color science of, of how objects reflect light. And, and it's a simple thing, but we don't think about it in the same way. So. That's right. Um, we're getting toward, kind of towards the end here. Does anybody have any questions out there? I haven't been looking at the attendees. Um, I, have, I have questions and answers up, but I don't see any questions from anybody. We took Catherine's both there. I took all the ones from Catherine. Yeah, I answered it. Open to, I, we asked both of those, so we're good. Thank you, Catherine. Um, yeah. um, anything from anybody else? Questions from anyone out there? Okay, we'll keep going then. So we got a few more minutes. Cool. I, I this is this has been fun because I don't think you know you and I have the 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 luxury of being able to work in the future and all. I mean, I've been working in extended data with Fujinon and Sony and and Zeiss for over a year to be able to help make that function the way it does, and and gone through the whole process where they started adding zoom functionality to the lenses and did that. But it's still about handling the data on set. It's handling data in a way that we hadn't had to do before. But it's the tools that 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 Teradek offers. It's not just the you know it's just not the camera monitoring. It's not just audio that's wireless. It's now our, our, our video monitoring. It's our video village is remote. And, it, and it's changed the way we work. And I think, I think COVID, while it is, is you know, separated us, has 
forced the industry to fundamentally change at the rate it thinks it changes rather than the rate that it has actually changed over the last yeah. century. I, I mean, Hollywood always talks about, oh, we're moving forward, we're moving forward, but it's really just crawling ahead. Until we got to digital 10 years ago, we didn't move this fast. <laughs> no. No, yeah. and 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 some of the the most the, the the editors and the colorists and the talent that are that are working most are the ones that aren't always able to adopt to the next platform because they're so busy. It's it, you don't you need that R and D time, right? Yeah. So so you know Avid has been uh, you know a, a mainstay uh, over the years, but anytime we ask what version you're on, usually the bigger the project, the <laughs> further back they were, because it's stable. <laughs> Stability is key, right? right? right. Well, it, it allows for consistency then. It, you yeah. know, that's one of those things too, is that stability allows for consistency because you're doing it the same way all the time and nothing changes. But that doesn't mean that you're um, evolving. And, and in a lot right. of sense, a lot of Hollywood was devolving until we got to digital. And then there was, you know, everybody threw their hands up at digital. It's like, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. And it's like, it's just a computer file. And it's changed everything. But you know, that that's only 10 years ago in a couple of weeks. You know, Fukushima right. was was it was is 2011 was was That's right. in, you know is 2011 in March 18th or 22nd or something like that. So it's very very soon. It's the fundamental point in time where everything changed and, and forced us to go digital because it wiped out all the tape manufacturing. <laughs> That's right. That's right. And and in that and those the old cameras like you were talking about earlier with the the Star Wars the F900s and Fs you know F900 Fs and the very cams um, the, and all are, of those yeah yeah, yeah the, those basically um, were considered you know, today, even video cameras, that was, that's what separated um, a, 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 a high-end TV show from a soap opera, right? So it, it right. had that look. And, and then when we got to the Red, uh, you know, one, and then the Alexa and others, now we're, we're so expanded that there's so much you can do. And, and that's why it's super important. In fact, on the, on the, the uh, virtual production stages, I'm really pushing everything to be an HDR. Because there's yeah. so much, you know, if you can see the HDR at home, you need to be at your widest possible. It's why we push aces. It's why we push wide, wide gamut. Um, and, then, and then take it down from there. Now, funny things can happen when you do that sometimes. But, and those are th the things that are being worked on. But it's really important that you work in the widest band possible uh, and, and then have instructions that say what to do with that data later on, like you're looking at it on your iPad. Well, sir, this has been a great conversation, Greg. I, I, I've enjoyed the hell out of this. I, I hope everybody else did. Um, uh, there's a question in the thing, guys, I intend to use a camera with Genlock camera and use a Genlock generating device. Yes, you do. Um, yep. when, you, when, you're, when you're generating um, uh, a Genlock, yeah, you do it from a master source and, and head out. It's gotta, be a, it's gotta be a house clock and it's gotta be tri-level yep. sync. It's not just black burst or anything else. It's got to be tri-level sync because everything is going to have to hit a different time base. And that's one of the most complicated parts of all of this is, you know, the screens refresh at 60 frames. The camera and the monitors usually refresh at 30 frames, P, not 2997. And we usually shoot drop frame at 2398. So it's 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 far more complicated than people think to do this and it's old broadcast tricks i mean it's the same tools we did to sync cameras you know 15 years ago when the first digital ones came out and you just go back to what yep. you know so uh we got a comment the mirror board was awesome It'd be reasonably to doable to scale that for a different setup for more of a once a year corporate virtual conference in case you read and yeah it basically says it, you know use that diagram and use it for the same thing just you know change the scale a little bit and and yeah we all do that um if you if you do much in post-production you draw those diagrams a lot um i have a bunch of them for productions i've worked on yeah greg i have I, to I, yeah you have to well it's, it's a planning it's it's the advanced planning that you have to do i have to jump off because i've got another cool. session here in, in, a, in a few minutes and and that Greg, you have been phenomenal. I thank you for joining us. And I thank everybody else for being here because it's important for people to see a perspective that's not necessarily yours. And, and I want to thank you and John Lamon and the team at Teradec for, for helping out and, and sponsoring this. And, and I really appreciate just your time and effort for this. Thank you, sir. Yeah, I appreciate it. Thank you, Gary. Yep. Bye, guys.